So, good morning everybody. My name is Lorraine and I'm part of the preaching team here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this space. Thank you for the opportunity to share together about how amazing you are. And I pray this morning that the words I speak would fall in a way which is helpful and helps people to know of your great love for them and of how much grace you have for all of us. And we know, Lord, that it's by your grace that we are here, Lord. And I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I say, hi everyone, my name is Lorraine, I'm part of the preaching team here at Sutton Vineyard Church. I've been at this church for about 20 years or so, something like that, um, and I, in my day job, I'm a religious studies teacher at a school nearby, um, we've got three children, and I'm married to Dave, um, and so this morning, my talk is entitled, Why is Grace So Unfair?, about 20 years ago, a book came out. Some of you might recognize it. It was called What's So Amazing About Grace? And if I close my eyes really tightly, I can just imagine this book sitting on my bookshelf in my childhood bedroom. I'd been a Christian for about two years, and I thought this book looked kind of important, so I read it. Roll on about 10 years or so from there, and I'm sitting in our flat. Uh, it's 2.30 in the morning. And I've got a tiny baby in my arms, and I'm trying to feed said tiny baby, and it was very hard work. And the anthem that was definitely one for me when I was breastfeeding was Amazing Grace by the former slave trader, John Newton. There were two powerful moments in my life, and they kind of provoked the question, well, why is grace so important? But first of all, I guess, what is grace? If we look at the Bible, it says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Paul, one of the early church leaders, says something similar to John. He says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And then James, Jesus' brother, he says something similar. But he, Jesus, gives us more grace. So clearly, if we want to find out about what grace is, then we look to the person of Jesus. The word in Hebrew is kunun, and it is related to the noun, kehen. I think maybe some of us might be more familiar with the Greek word charis, and it's obviously a, a lady's name as well, and it means to show favor and undeserved kindness. So I'm a teacher, I love a keyword, so our keyword this morning is grace, and grace means unmerited favor and undeserved kindness. So if we're going to figure out what this word really means, we need to look at what Jesus taught and how he showed kindness to people. So in my thinking about this talk, I came across again the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And Jesus taught in parables, and he knows how we learn best. We like stories, we're very nosy, we like to learn about other people, and this is a good way that we learn. And of course, in a parable, we find that the meaning is often quite implicit. So let's read said parable. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those, who were hired, those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last only worked one hour, they said. And you have made us equal to us, them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, 
I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do with what, what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So at the heart of our passage this morning, I believe, is the grace of God. Jesus tells this parable as a response to a statement just before in Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So what can you expect for the next 25 minutes? There's a talk of two halves, really. The first half is going to be about how God extends his grace to us as humans. We are 100% loved by God, and we are accepted, but of course he wants us to grow into better versions of ourselves. We will see that it's actually kind of, we'll consider how it's actually unfair that those who work the hardest don't actually deserve more reward. That's kind of confusing to me. But God is immensely gracious to the latecomers, and we'll think about if we truly got what we deserved, then perhaps we wouldn't be with God at all. And if we can understand this, taking it on one step further, and we realize we're kind of broken, then we have always the choice to surrender to God's love. And then secondly, what does Jesus teach about God's grace and the person of God in this parable? God is good. In his core, he is grace. And we can unpack, if we want to, in our minds, if we're listening, um, we can if we choose, what we believe is fair, And how we can extend mercy and love and kindness and grace to all of those, especially those people who are not kind to us. Okay, so, as we said, this parable was a response to that statement, and it was actually about who belongs in the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is the place where God is in charge. God reigns. And one of Jesus' close friends, Peter, uh, says just before this, he says... We have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? So they've obviously given up a lot of things, so they're expecting kind of a big reward. For the first time at the end of this chapter, Jesus says, many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Then he teaches this parable about the vineyard, and as we've heard already, the last sentence of it is, so the first will be last, and the last will be first. So he repeats it twice. And when the Bible does something twice, you think, well, that's kind of important. So first of all, in our story, we've got some characters. So who are these people in our story? Well, the owner is most definitely God. Okay, tick, good. Um, The other people, we're not really sure. There's three suggestions that perhaps I have for you that who they could represent, maybe. So maybe they represent, first of all, the Jewish people who came first, and then perhaps they're the uh, non-Jews, or the Gentiles, we call them. Both of them come to understand that they belong in the kingdom of God and can be co-citizens and co-heirs with Jesus. There's a second interpretation of maybe who these people represent. Perhaps they're the representative of the disciples who left their lives at different stages to follow Jesus. God can never be less than fair. And we discover that he is more than fair. And then maybe a third interpretation, alternatively, is that these people are the the people who became Christians kind of like last of all. And God blesses them because they achieve great things for his kingdom. And then maybe Jesus intended all of these three audiences and more because he is Jesus and he can just do that. But definitely this parable is about blessing and about reward, but not as we think. Okay, first of all then, grace for humans. God wants to give what is right. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? So what's the issue, bless you? What is the issue this morning? Well, the issue is that the workers are kind of annoyed. They're annoyed because the the owner of the vineyard is really gracious and generous and Surely the later workers who did like one hour don't deserve the same as the people who started at the beginning. And actually, it seems totally unfair that those who started 
earliest, work hardest, don't get more. But actually, we learn that it doesn't really matter. Those who were hired first had agreed to be paid one denarius for their day's work, and they agreed to that. And then the later workers received the same, but for little work. We learn that God treats us according to who he is and not who we are or what we have done. You see, the hiring of a, a, day's work, a, day, a day worker was quite normal in Palestine where Jesus lived. There were heavy taxes and high debts and scarce resources and few people actually had a permanent job. And so people would hire themselves out as like a day labourer to provide for their families and one denarius was enough to do that. People would stand in the marketplace and offer their, themselves out as a day labourer. And perhaps there is a broader application to this in that the owner does pay them enough to feed their families. The social situation was that actually small farmers had been forced off their land and they had a lot of debts to pay because of the Roman taxes. And so therefore we, it's quite, it was quite common for large groups of unemployed men to gather in the morning to hope, hoping to be hired for the day. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. Now, the landowner says, I will pay you what is right. Seems a bit wrong to me, actually. It's, he said, he will pay what is right. God has an equal and open attitude to everyone. Perhaps this is a lesson in understanding what is right and good and true. I want to give the same. God wants to give the same regardless of the hard work that people put in. He responds by calling those who hired, were hired first friends and says, I've done no wrong. I agreed to pay you the same. God treats us according to what he is like, not what they have done, or actually what they have deserved. So if God's grace is unlimited and unconditional, well, are there no consequences to our actions? Well, actually, yes, there are always consequences. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the um, Roman church, the church in Rome. Uh, the letter of Romans, he talks about how, actually, they sort of thought they got it, and they were like, yes, okay, so if we sin some more, then we'll get more grace, and so therefore, we'll sin a lot. Well then, what should we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul says, no, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? God's unconditional love and kindness and mercy draws us in to him. He is in his nature compassionate and forgiving, but that doesn't mean that our choices don't have consequences. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? We are undeserving, but God's love is overflowing. His blessing and his grace don't run out. There is an utter abundance of grace and kindness available to us. Maybe, like me, you might find this a bit difficult to accept. God's grace actually has nothing to do with the principle of deserving. Put it this way, I don't give my kids love because they deserve it. They haven't earned it. I simply love them. Dr. Richard Rohr says, any notion that I deserve, I am owed, I have a right to, I am higher than you, absolutely undermines any notion of faith, hope, or love. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, but to each one of us grace is given as Christ apportioned it. Now we're taught quite at an early age that bad behavior deserves negative consequences not lavish grace. So early on in my teaching career at secondary school, I had the most awful year 10 class. They were hideous. 
And one Wednesday afternoon, we'd had this terrible lesson. There were tears, not from them. And I thought, what shall I do? Do you know what? I'm just going to go home. I went to buy some shoes. It was great. Um, but my shoes didn't fix the problem. I knew the kids were learning nothing. And so I decided to be radically graceful. And I bought in the next lesson some chocolates. They were like, what is she doing? We were awful to her last lesson. They were totally bewildered. But our relationship changed right then. As a teacher, I had the choice in that moment to treat them with lavish grace or not. Perhaps I was able then to teach them a greater lesson. At primary school, how different it would have been if our son hadn't been put on the rain cloud every lesson, on the behavior chart for not listening, not sitting still, not, not doing what he was asked, but no one knew in reception that he was autistic and couldn't figure it out. And then roll on a few years later, we know that his aggressive behavior and, and his, um, is, is fueled by his anxiety. And um, in those moments, we will allow him to play on his expert, Xbox because it's nothing to do with him being deserving, because no one is deserving. And we try our best to see through the behavior to this child who is in fight or flight. God's grace is given to people who don't deserve it. Not just nice people who don't deserve it, not just people who repent and say sorry and they change and they stop, but actually God's grace is given to everybody, nice people and not so nice people. God's grace doesn't stop. It doesn't, st isn't, doesn't stop. God's grace is for the unjust and the just, those people who like me and those people who don't like me. This doesn't seem very fair. <laughs> but God is more than fair. He can never be less than fair. Okay, so if we embrace this, that's marvellous. Let's think about that. So maybe we can be like those people that God calls friends. I'd quite like that. Yeah, that would be cool. We could be like those people God called friends. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? We could take our pay and go, knowing that God is more generous and actually in more wisdom that, of course, the last will be first. But this is hard because everything around me tells me to put myself first. But of course, everything in Jesus' kingdom is upside down. A few weeks ago, Steve talked about how Jesus is fully human and fully God. And he came to the conclusion that Jesus chose the upside down way. He chose to empty himself of his divinity and leave the glory of heaven. In one of my lessons about a Wednesday, two, two or three Wednesdays, it always happens on a Wednesday, uh, two or three Wednesdays ago, uh, one of my year eights said to me, why would God choose to sacrifice himself, miss? And this young man in year eight, as a Muslim, and he was really wrestling with the idea that God would surrender everything in this act of love. In my preparation, I came, another in, came across another interesting quote about how we surrender to win as Christians. We die to live. Jesus chose the way of surrender. And I wonder if we could just pause and consider this idea of lavish grace that is poured out upon us. Paul says, again, we believe it's through the grace of God that we are saved. So I can give my God my feelings of not being deserving or being deserving because actually no one is. God is fair beyond fair. There are always consequences when we turn to our own desires and turn away from God, but... He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. There's a plan. So I invite us to wrestle maybe with this notion this morning, a bit like my year eight student, about sacrificial love. You see, when a loving relationship kind of breaks down, the lovers will often try and reconcile for the sake of that love, and Jesus put himself forward and sacrificed himself in order so that we could be reconciled to God. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. The cross was the ultimate act of surrender. Jesus surrendered his will and he chose to die for us all. He could have stopped it. I surrender to win. 
Jesus surrendered so he could win for us. In his grace and his love, in his unmerited kindness. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Okay, second part, let's go. So who is this God of grace? God wants to give us love and grace in abundance. He's always gracious and kind and he always gives us everything. He is love. From the beginning of creation, God is love. I want to give whatever is right. So in this parable, the humans, the parable people will receive what is right. Now, I'm pretty rubbish at giving gifts. I don't mind receiving gifts, but I find giving gifts really hard. And the best gifts, actually, are the just because gifts. You know when you see a gift and you're like, oh, that person would really like that. There's no real reason to give them a gift. It's just because to show them love and kindness beyond anything that they have done. So there's, obviously we're familiar with the golden rule of treat other people as we like to be treated. But perhaps what we're suggesting here is that we go one step further and treat people with this lavish, bonkers, kind of out there grace and love, like God does. Now, our wedding anniversary is at the end of January, so when Valentine's Day rolls around, we know not to bother to like, give each other a Valentine's Day gift, because I think sometimes it's a bit rubbish, isn't it, when you feel you have to give someone a gift that you love, because it just sort of feels a bit like, oh, okay. But actually, grace is a bit different. Grace is a just-because gift. God gives us this just-because gift because he wants to give whatever is right. The power of the vineyard teaches that in the kingdom of God, there is blessing and reward, and God chooses according to his will and his choice. And we need to be kind of ready to be surprised at who is there. Nine times in the Old Testament, it says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. In the law books of Exodus, and in the poetry of King David in the Psalms, and then about 200 years after that, in the books of prophecy uh, like Jonah, we read that God is gracious. This promise was to Israel, to the people who had left Egypt. But then in another of the Psalms, in Psalm 145, David says, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. So perhaps it's not just for the Jews. There's no perhaps about it. It is not just for the Jews. God's love is for everyone. God's grace is for everybody. Everybody is invited to be co-heirs, co-citizens with Jesus. The Bible makes it clear that there is no short supply of grace available. Peter says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So there is plenty where that came from, all just because. Grace is unmerited kindness. Our God is one of surprises. He is never less than fair. He is grace personified. As Christians, we believe that we are saved by grace, even those who don't deserve it. He is grace beyond belief. But then grace and justice aren't the same. So therefore, maybe we need to re-examine what we think is fair in our own circumstances, in terms of what happens to me personally, and how I treat other people. Let me give you a little bit of a story to explain what I mean by fair. So I couldn't believe it. I'd spent four amazing days in the mountains. It was awesome. I had taken uh, some kids there from school, and I decided on the last day, to, uh, so the four, end of the fourth day, to take the icy bit down the bottom of the mountain, totally wiped out, really annoyed with myself, fell, not on my face quite, but on my shoulder, couldn't ski, very sad. And I began to beat myself up, and I thought, oh, Lorraine, why did you do that? Why did you take the like, icy bit at the end? Why, didn't you, why did you say yes to do that last fun run down the mountain with your colleague? It had been an emotionally long day. I had taken some anxious kids down the mountain that day, uh, and they had done really, really well. But then I began to think, do you know what? Don't beat yourself up, Lorraine. I'd had this remarkable trip to Austria with the kids, They'd been brilliant. I love the mountains. I hadn't been skiing for like 12 years and had such an awesome time. And I'm pleased to say I learned a lot from falling over. Instead of being really angry at the injustice of the situation, about missing these two days, I thought I realized something. That morning, I'd read this really cool thing that said, in our journey, frustrations are magnificent opportunities for grace. 
So trying to re-examine this idea of grace and fairness, I learned a lot about grace for myself. But how about grace for other people? So rewind four hours. I'm still on the mountain. I've got three kids who are with me. They're 16, 15, and 14. They're absolutely petrified. Will you be with us after lunch, miss? This is at lunchtime. I'm eating my nice cheese roll. Yes, I will be with you after lunch. Don't worry. They were absolutely petrified I was going to abandon them. Thank you, miss. Thank you. I really like it when it's just our little group. I poured myself out on the mountain for these three kids to enable them to go from not skiing to skiing. It was brilliant. And it was at the end of that day that I then fell over. But do you know what? I gave everything so that they could overcome their fear and enjoy freedom, just like I feel in the mountains. Maybe some might say, oh, Lorraine, you pay for that later. But actually, no. My gift to them that day was patience and encouragement and smiles as they came down the mountain again and again. We did it seven times in the end. It took 50 minutes to do the first run. I mean, I was very impressed with them. And I felt sure I was being really gracious. But actually, I don't think I was. The kids, of course, deserve kindness and love and patience. And when we act extra kindly, we give this extraordinary gift. But actually, it's not grace. Grace is treating people who don't deserve it with lavish love and mercy and kindness and forgiveness. Just because. Jesus was being deliberately controversial in this bit where he said in Matthew, You have heard it said, love your neighbor. Hate your enemy, but I love you. I I love you. Well, I do love you. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Okay, so if that's not an example of gaze, what is? Well, my chocolates for year 10 was quite a nice example. Um, Or what about this one? I get home one Tuesday afternoon after work, and there's five people in my house in a different state of stress. Husbands, kids, mother. (laughs) And I have seven minutes to turn this around so I can get my son out to football, and I have to deal with all five members of my family very, very differently. Now, I'm quite good at fighting fires and, like, smoothing out tensions, and within six minutes... His boots were on, I was heading out the door with a cup of tea in my hand, I thought, winner. It had been a long day for everybody, and I had had a very crazy day at school, but of course I loved my family, and I wanted to put myself in their shoes, in their boots, and I tried to respond to this challenge extra, extra kindly. I could feel the stress and impatience radiating out from my fellow adults. My daughter was screaming, please don't leave, mummy, and the sad tone of my son, who'd had an awful day at school. But I still had to leave, and... I couldn't ignore them and rush out the door, but I gave as much as I could in those six minutes. They didn't mean to treat me in an ungracious way, of course, but my gift to them in that moment was comfort, patience, forgiving their impatient words, and grace. God is gracious to his core, and it should hopefully be the core of us too. The way that God deals with us ideally would stimulate a change in me, in us, in this view of what is fair and in how we can extend grace to other people. We can look at what Jesus did and attempt to be grace in their lives, to be Jesus in their lives. And then maybe, just maybe, our perspective shifts and we can act accordingly. God's grace is to be received to be experienced, to be enjoyed, and ultimately passed on to others. Can I have the worship team back, please? Some days, I totally get it. I say, yes, Lord, I totally understand your grace. I'm confident to stand in it, upon it. And other days, I just cannot equip myself with the knowledge that God is gracious and forgiving, and he will help me start again. Maybe you might be like Brené Brown, who says, but I don't want to surrender to win, I want to fight to win. Because that kind of seems a bit more fair and a bit more just. But in a flurry of just-because gifts, God lavishes his grace upon us readily, steadily, and the question is, are we ready to receive it? It is clear from the parable of the workers in the vineyard that God extends his grace to all people. 
And it's our choice whether or not we say yes and receive it. Amen. I'd like us to stand, if you don't mind, and I'm going to read Psalm 103. So this is Psalm 103, verses 8 to 11. If you feel comfortable, feel free to close your eyes or stretch out your hands in an act of receiving. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Thank you.